homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. This is a question and answer session specifically on the Karaniya Metta Sutta on the practice of cultivating loving kindness or metta. The question is, should we cultivate metta towards ourselves? There's a universal well-being chant that I learned at a monastery and the first verse is to wish yourself to have well-being. How does this align with the Karaniya Metta Sutta? So this is a question that is commonly asked, it's frequently asked because many of the instructions, including chants like the Universal Wellbeing Chant, are commonly practiced throughout uh, monasteries and other places. And there have been many books that have been written and uh, there's also commentaries to the suttas that indicate some kind of practice that begins with wishing yourself well, wishing yourself happiness and, and that sort of thing. So it's understandable that people have this question and it's really good to answer it. So the short answer is the Buddha in the Sutta Pithika, in the Pali Canon, does not appear to have asked us to wish ourselves well. In fact, um, there's a reason for that and that's something that we'll explain in answering this question. But I think a good way of also addressing this question is also to go through something like the Universal Wellbeing Chant in a broad sense to look at the source of where that chant has come from. So we understand a bit better whether these were words of the Buddha. Also to actually look again at the Karaniya Metta Sutta just to see has Buddha actually said that. And then to look at another sutta that people attribute to where also one wishes oneself well and to discount that to actually see uh, that it's not there and then finally to really get into the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of the Buddha's teaching to look at it from right view and how Buddha is correcting wrong view and where that is coming from what is what are the perversions that the Buddha is correcting and why it actually lends itself to not wishing method to oneself when we look at the universal well-being chant, it's good to methodically go through this uh, by looking at six particular sections because they have different sources. The first section is where people attribute uh, the instructions on wishing method to oneself, wishing one well-being to oneself. And this verse is all about uh, wishing uh, freedom from affliction, freedom from hostility, freedom from ill will, freedom from anxiety and wishing to live happily and maintaining well-being. So this particular verse appears to line up with um, the words that are contained in the chapter on Brahma Viharas in the Visuddhimagga. So the Visuddhimagga is attributed to someone named Buddha Gosa and this was written as a commentary and exposition on the suttas and on the Abhidhamma. So this was written in 5th century BC, which is much later after the Buddha. And in that particular chapter, you find uh, the instructions that start with wishing method to oneself and then wishing to others in terms of people, types of people that you wish to. So that's where that comes from. It's not actually attributed to the Buddha. Then uh, the second section is where you wish everyone else to have well-being, freedom from hostility, freedom from ill will, freedom from anxiety, and then to live happily or to maintain well-being in themselves. This particular um, section, it closely lines up with the Patisambhidamaka, which is the path of discrimination that is attributed to Venerable Sariputta, so the great disciple of the Buddha. And in that section on metta, on loving kindness, he goes through uh, this sequence of, of five things that you wish that to all different types of, of beings. And uh, this does line up with the Buddha's teaching in terms of all shapes and sizes, all living, breathing things, where you wish outwardly to everybody else with no distinction in terms of excluding anyone or preventing uh, that wish to, to any kind of living beings. 
Then the third section is, may all beings be released from suffering? This particular statement um, doesn't have an actual source, but the gist of where it's coming from is actually fine, that you wish all beings to be released from suffering, from the whole mass of suffering. So uh, no, no particular source from the suttas or the commentaries, but there doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with this statement. Then when you come to, uh, may they not be parted from their good fortune they have attained. This uh, seems to come from a commentary to the Abhidhamma. So there was a commentary that was written on the Abhidhammata uh, Sangaha and it appears to be in this Abhidhamma Vibhavani part of the commentary. So that again is not something that is directly attributable to Buddha and so as much as there's nothing particularly wrong with that but it's not necessarily part of the Buddha's cultivation of metta. Now the final uh, verse is all about kamma and that one is a straight lift from the sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya in the chapter 5 discourse number 57 all around the frequent recollections and so that is something that is attributable to the Buddha. So when you look at the universal well-being chant in its entirety, it's a mixture of sources and a mixture of things which are not attributable to the Buddha. And one or two things, one, one particular thing, the one on Kama, which is attributable to the Buddha. So when you actually look at that, it's good to know uh, what you're chanting and also to know the source of it and also to know what is actually uh, a direct teaching of the Buddha. Now there is a sutta called the Raja Sutta which is um, from the Udana and it's chapter 5, uh, discourse 1. And this is all about a discourse with a king. And in this uh, sutta sometimes people attribute this to where one can wish, uh, they infer that one could wish method to oneself based on this sutta. When you look at this sutta, what it says is having gone around in all directions with the mind, there is no one found who is more dear than oneself in the same way others are dear to themselves. Therefore, one should not harm another if you are dear to yourself. So the way that people infer is that if uh, you are dear to oneself, then you wish your, yourself uh, well. But there's nothing in this sutta, and this is only an excerpt from that, that uh, sutta from the Udana, that the Buddha is actually saying that. The Buddha is only saying that if you consider yourself dear, and most people do consider themselves dear, then you don't wish harm on, on another. That really out of that idea, that uh, center of gravity, that if you wouldn't harm yourself, then you wouldn't harm another. And that is really where the Buddha is coming from, not about wishing oneself well. The other sutta that is also referenced is the Piya Sutta, about being dear. And again, similar to the Raja Sutta, the, this is in the Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 3, discourse number 4, and it says, If you regard yourself as dear, you wouldn't yoke yourself to wickedness, for happiness is not easy to find by someone who does bad deeds. So, again, what people infer is that if you consider yourself dear, then one must be wishing oneself well. But the thrust of where the Buddha is coming from is really around Papa around evil things, evil thoughts, around doing unwholesome, unskillful things. And so the thrust of where Buddha is coming from is that you wouldn't do wickedness or evil things, unwholesome things, if you regard yourself as dear. That the mind, you know, when you go through Karaniya Metta Sutta, the mind gets polluted, it gets stained. You don't come to a glad mind if you do bad deeds. And that is where the Buddha is coming from, rather than the fact of wishing oneself well. The emphasis is on bad deeds, the discouragement of undertaking unwholesome mental um, action, verbal action, and then physical action. Because well-being in the mind, happiness in the mind, gladness in the mind does not actually uh, come to fruition. 
if one is actually doing unwholesome things with body, speech and mind. And so it's not really, I can't infer from both uh, the Raja Sutta and the Pia Sutta that the Buddha is saying to wish oneself well. It's more about the wickedness, about the Papa, the evil things, the unwholesome things that one may be abiding in and that doesn't lend itself to happiness. So that is where the Buddha is coming from. So now if we come back to the Karaniya Metta Sutta and we just glance through the whole of that Sutta, there is not one word that actually uh, wishes oneself uh, to have well-being, to wish oneself Metta. In fact, when you look at the core virtues, the core virtues are actually asking you to not reinforce oneself. So when you go through upright, thoroughly upright, your physical actions, your verbal actions are really around not harming anybody else, not having ill will towards anybody else. When you come to easy to instruct, gentle, not arrogant, contented, easy to support, with few duties and living a modest life, controlled in the sense faculties, prudent, courteous, not yearning to associate with families. That whole section is really about removing any further stains. Uh, whether they're to, towards one's physical actions, verbal actions, or mental actions. In fact, all the way through, when you look at the reinforcement of removing any further anger or ill will, uh, not having any views, particularly wrong views, what the Buddha is saying is, for example, what's really important in the metta is not having stinginess, not having selfishness, because if you reinforce yourself, you are creating a sense of self, a sense of me and mine. When you look at stinginess, you look at Labha Macharya, which is stinginess in gain, me and my gains, me and my wealth, me and the things that I've acquired. Then you have Kula Macharya, me and my groups and families, uh, people I like, people I don't like. Um, it puts limitations on where loving kindness can be cultivated. And it's far reaching if you can actually remove all the barriers about me and my friends, me and my family, me and my race, me and my gender orientation, me and my sexual orientation, me and my country, me and my sports team, me and my strong preferences. So Buddha is very clear about that when it comes to stinginess. Then you have Avasa Macharya, me and my dwellings, my home. Again, Buddha is saying not to, not to uh, have that kind of center of gravity because then you can't uh, go beyond one's home, one's dwelling, uh, go near and far, uh, seen and unseen, to actually cultivate this loving kindness. And then when it comes to Dhamma Macharya, you know, having particular stinginess or selfishness around one's views, particularly about oneself, that one starts to let go of wrong views that are based on oneself to raise oneself up and lower others. And then you have the um, Vannamacharya, which is the stinginess with reputation. Again, this is out of Labha Sakara Silokam, wanting popularity, fame, and other types of respect one actually um, tries to always hold one's reputation up, one's sila up, one's discipline. And again, when it comes to metta, Buddha is actually trying to remove that. And that's quite early on in the Karaniya Metta Sutta. Then when you come to not associating with um, particular families or groups, again, it's not reinforce, reinforcing me and mine. It's actually re removing this perversion of me and mine, this sense of atta, so Buddha is actually trying to correct it to be more anatta. And essentially, the method that Buddha is using is that if you see anicca, if you see that we are all brothers and sisters in old age, sickness and death, which is where this anicca comes from, the bigger picture that we are all subject to decay, to the breaking down of the body, no one is free of, of this predicament, then you understand the suffering, the dukkha of this predicament, and therefore you actually see that it's not worth taking as me and mine. That is the fundamental mechanics of the Karaniya Metta Sutta. 
that you actually see that. And what actually you see as well is that you see the asuba, that this body does get old. It does ripen and get old. It is subject to this, this illness that makes it actually, as we age and get sick, it does make it um, not beautiful, not pleasing. And then, you know, ultimately we, we pass away. And so there is no refuge in this, in this self or this body itself. And so that's where Buddha says, really look at, really look at that, these perversions, because if you look at it, then everything becomes uh, less separated, that you start to see there's no separation in the predicament from you and any other living being, and that's how you wish metta. And so that's why you don't actually wish metta to oneself, because you're not trying to reinforce any kind of misapprehension about this self, whether it's the physical form or whether it's the, the, the self that is created by mental fabrications. So uh, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, when you look at it, it, it actually, Buddha through the insight pathway is actually correcting that. So if you were to wish oneself well, then you are reinforcing the wrong thing. And essentially when you get to the last part of this Sutta, the only way you can actually remove the greed is to actually have the correct view about this body and this, this mind and the things that are all fabricated. So you wouldn't come back to a mother's womb in that case if you had the right view. So essentially it's really important to apply Yonis or Manasakara, this careful attention, this wise attention to those perversions that in doing the Karani Metta Sutta, when you train it, you're actually training to see Asuba, which is the not pleasing, uh, not beautiful, to actually see the uh, the dukkha rather than the sukha. So you see that this whole mass of suffering in creating this body, it's not fun. It's actually any kind of happiness is temporary. And so this predicament is actually a whole mass of suffering. And to be bound to it through lifetimes is not something that one actually wants. And the nietzsche, the unnietzsche part, the unlasting, the problematic creation of a body that constantly gets old, gets sick, and then passes away is something that uh, is not actually, it's troublesome. It's a theity, it's troublesome. It's very shameful to even take refuge in such a body. So it's harayati. And then it's also jigujati. It's disgusting when you, you fall for it. And therefore, when you come to anatta, you realize it's not worth taking as me and mine, that um, there's nothing there that's worth worth taking as me and mine. So when you come to um, these last couple of suttas I wanted to cover, is really because it's a, it's a caution that there is a risk if we slander the, the Buddha. So this sutta, which is called the Abhasita Sutta, and it's in the Anguttara Nikaya chapter 2, and this is uh, verse 23. And this is talking about what was not said by the Tathagata, the Buddha. And it says, monks, these two slander the Tathagata, which two? He who explains what was not said or spoken by the Tathagata as said or spoken by the Tathagata, and he who explained what was said or spoken by the Tathagata as not said or spoken by the Tathagata, these two who slander the Tathagata. So the reason I raise it is because it's really important in our practice not to self-sabotage our practice, whether we are learning the Dhamma or we are sharing the Dhamma. If we explain something as being spoken by the Buddha that hasn't been said by the Buddha, it is slander. And there are repercussions, there are karmic repercussions for that. Likewise, if we say that something has been spoken or said by the Buddha, but it hasn't been spoken by the Buddha, then again, uh, it is something that slanders. So we have to be very, very careful. So when it comes to this question around wishing method to oneself, this is not something that has been spoken by the Buddha. And we mustn't actually teach that to others or to actually practice that. 
uh, both are equally devastating in terms of the karmic implications. The first one where you teach it to others or you say that this is what the Buddha has has shared, unless you can find it in the suttas, uh, one shouldn't be saying that. It hasn't been attributed. And the second one is if you practice that, then you will see a deviation. You won't see progress on your path. And so by that alone, one should refrain from wishing method to oneself. It reinforces a perversion, which is this sense of me and mine. And where karaniya metta is so very precious is that it's actually removing those perversions, allowing you to see that in order to get out of sansara, one needs to remove those perversions to correct the view, to use yoniso manisikara in the correct way. And just to round off uh, the same thing, there is the Niyata Sutta, which is again in chapter 2 of the Anguttu Nikaya, and it's verse number 25. And it's about a meaning to be inferred. And it says, Monks, these two slander the Tathagata, which two? One who explains a discourse whose meaning needs to be inferred as one whose meaning has already been fully drawn out. And one who explains a discourse whose meaning has already been fully drawn out as one whose meaning needs to be inferred. So, if I go back to the Karaniya Metta Sutta, Buddha has fully drawn out his teaching on how to cultivate loving kindness very precisely. And in the sessions that we went through, we went line by line to look at what the Buddha has said and what the Buddha means. And so that was, you know, with the support of other suttas, other teachings of the Buddha, we inferred the meaning behind the Buddha's words in the Karani Metta Sutta. That's the safest way of approaching suttas. You look for suttas and sayings of the Buddha, verses of the Buddha that support an understanding of one particular teaching of the Buddha. And if you find all the same kind of undertones, fragrances, explanations and meanings, even from the Noble Arahants, then you understand and you can infer the right meaning. But if you make an inference outside of that, if you use uh, later written commentaries as your main source, or if you imply it yourself, then you are slandering the, the, the Tathagata. And it is very um, dangerous to do so, very risky. Over many lifetimes, we have probably done that. And so in including this sutra as well, um, it's just to encourage and emphasize that we must be very careful how we do these things and to make sure that if we are teaching Dhamma, not to put ourselves in a risky position and not to lead people astray. And likewise, if you are practicing this, to be very certain that whoever you learn Dhamma from, whoever you um, listen to, that you understand yourself what the Buddha has said. It's very good to read more widely in the suttas, to try and understand them for yourself, to find people can, that can unlock the code, the Buddha's, Buddha's code in the suttas and the verses, someone who can teach you how to do that, to see the mechanics who emphasizes the undertone, the, the thrust of the Buddha's teachings in the right way. In that way, you learn correctly and you practice correctly and you don't sabotage your path. You don't rely on someone else. The Buddha has always asked us not to rely on others, but to rely on the Dhamma and the Vinaya. So it's really our teaching from the Buddha and the Noble Arahants and our discipline, our own sila. Because through the purity of one's own practice, one can then uh, penetrate through one's own mind and then to uh, sharpen one's injuries, one's spiritual faculties, and then to actually develop more wisdom on the path. So uh, this is the, the answer to the, the question that has been asked about wishing a method to oneself. Teruan Saranai, wish you all well.